Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Thank, thanks for team. Yeah. Today we're very honored to have Chris uh, Friedger from um, Invenio Imaging as co-founder and CTO. Uh, Chris, um, a little bit uh, introduction about Chris. Uh, Chris got his PhD from Harvard University on uh, physics. Yeah, where where that is, <laughs> and finished his postdoc training also in Harvard uh, University in Sunny Shiz Lab, which is actually one of the most prestigious. Uh, labs in Raymond Imaging and Single Molecule Genomics. Uh, he later co-founded Invenio Imaging with Sunny in uh, 2012 on um, microscopic analysis on molecular makeups of tissues and other materials. Uh, today, he will be talking about the state of art and future trends in pathology. Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, today, we have a lot of investor audience with or without a scientific background. Uh, well, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, most people are not familiar with pathology or Riemann imaging anyways, including me. Um, so there are uh, uh, also audience join us from um, bio seeding in China. Uh, welcome everyone, either from China or from the United States. If you have any question during the talk while you're watching, please use the chat box to communicate with us. Uh, we will have a Q&A session afterwards. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, let's welcome Chris to give an introduction about pathology. Chris, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael, for yeah the opportunity to to present here. Uh, thanks for the the entire team. It's it's really great to to be able to connect. Um, we'll keep this relatively easy, sort of starting with a background in pathology, um, heading into sort of digital pathology, the emergence of artificial intelligence and and molecular diagnostics. Um, so we'll spend about two thirds of the presentation on the background and really trends in the industry that are going on. On the last third of the presentation, I'll, I'll ju jump a little bit onto what we exactly do at Invenue Imaging and how it fits into these trends. So I want to start with sort of a background on histopathology and, and where it really fits into the, the whole picture of the, the patient journey. So if, if we look at a, a cancer patient, typically it, it starts with symptoms and uh, the, the patient would present with symptoms at the, at the hospital and would undergo with some level of, of imaging, uh, CT imaging, MR imaging, um, that would then identify a lesion um, to, to, a, to a degree where then the doctors would decide to, to take a biopsy in order to obtain some tissue um, that then can be analyzed with, by um, the pathology team to establish a differential diagnosis. And that really is sort of the essential role of pathology is to identify exactly what the source of the cancer is, um, what the stage of the cancer is. And then based on this information, the oncology or surgery teams can then plan the, the treatment of the patient. May that be a resection of the tumor or post-operative or possibly pre-operative um, treatments with chemotherapy, um, targeted um, therapeutics, or um, even immunotherapies. Um, there are smaller applications of pathology. So um, in at the stage of the biopsy, um, often the pathology team can there sort of determine whether a good enough sample was obtained, or pathology can also be used at the time of surgery in order to, to guide the surgical team for, for uh, tumor margins. But the primary um, time the pathology team really spends on differential diagnosis. Um, so in order um, for a tissue that comes out of a biopsy or from a resection to be analyzed by a pathologist, first, the laboratory team has to actually process that tissue specimen. So they would take the biopsy specimen, um, they would process it in a tissue processor embedded in, in paraffin to then be able to cut it in very thin sections, um, either using a microtome or a cryostat uh, that then can be stained with various stains um, using stain, um, an auto stainer in this case, to then be able to analyze with a traditional light microscope where sort of the pathologist will look into the eyepieces and at very high magnification be able to fly through the specimen and analyze the, the tissue at its cellular level. I get often asked, um, so what does cancer look like, right? How does a pathologist know that there's cancer there? What, what, what is it that they look for, right? Um, and this is an example from the, the, the cancer.gov homepage explaining the, the principle of, of grading a tumor. So if we start on the left, right, this is, is mostly benign tissue. Um, what one can see is that both the tissue architecture is well maintained, right? So this is an epithelial tissue that is that is organized in layers um, with sort of smaller cells at the bottom and could go into like larger cells at the top. And it's this, this typical organized structure 
that a pathologist would recognize as being well differentiated, meaning close to the natural origin of, of, of the tissue. You can also see that the nuclei are all fairly spherical. Um, they're about the same size. As we go to higher and higher grades, we can see that, that the nuclei now become suddenly um, polymorphic, meaning you have large nuclei, you have small nuclei, you have irregular shapes. In some cases, like, like this one, we can actually see a cell that undergoes cell division. Um, the more that happens, the, that means the more active the tumor is actually growing. Along that process, also the, the tissue loses differentiation, meaning the, the natural structure and organization of those cells gets lost to a point where you end up basically having cells that can break through these, these, these membranes and ultimately metastasize. So it is somewhat surprising that morphologic features, right, by looking at cells under a microscope, a pathologist can actually determine about the aggressiveness of the tumor. But that is the gold standard of, of, of cancer diagnosis today. Um, that is also combined with, with the fact that cells from different origin in the body can have very different shapes, right? So if you compare a muscle cell to a red blood cells or an adipose cells, they have very different appearance under the microscope. So those things put together, the, the staging and sort of the, the tracing, the, the source of the cell, um, ultimately it results in the full differential diagnosis of a patient. So for example, in, in lung cancer, um, there are actually different types of cells present in the lung. And depending which type of cell gives rise to the cancer, um, then defines the tumor type. Um, so one can have small cell carcinomas, which are not as common as the non-small cell non-carcinomas. And amongst those, the, the biggest group are the squamous cell carcinomas or the adenocarcinomas. So in the case of the squamous cell carcinoma, it is in the name that the, the source of the cancers are the squamous cells. And you can have various um, grading amongst them. Um, the reason why such differential diagnosis is so important is because depending on the source of, of the tumor or the, the specific type, Specific treatments are more effective than others. So really, pathology has this pivotal role in, in terms of ident identifying exactly the, state, um, the, 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 the right um, diagnosis for the patient. What has helped um, since, since the 80s and 90s is the, the advent of adding molecular diagnosis to, to this, this technique, uh, to, to, to the toolkit of the pathologist. So in this specific technique um, that's called IHC staining or, or antibody staining, one has a primary antibody that's that's coupled to a type of color center. So if the antibody can bind to a protein that's present in the cancer cell, it causes a stain. In this particular case, a, a, a brown stain for the positive cells. Um, this could also be fluorescently coupled, so it could be a fluorescent stain as well. Um, so by able to by being able to stain for, for example, the TTF1 antibody or the P40 antibody, it's possible to create a molecular marker for whether it's an adenocarcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma, which ultimately is a big advantage over purely morphology-based techniques that 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 are more subjective. So looking at the pros and cons and, and sort of the placing histopathology really in the in the in the um, the overall ecosystem. Um, what makes this pathology so great is, is its accuracy. Um, it, it really is the best way and the gold standard way to creating a, a differential diagnosis for a patient. Obviously, that comes at the cost of, of invasiveness, right? When one has to get a tissue biopsy in order to, to be able to deliver that accurate diagnosis. And um, that is sort of the, the reason why not everything is, is diagnosed with MR or, or um, spectroscopic imaging. Um, looking at sort of more um, practical limitations, um, it is a manual and labor intensive process. It can take a week to two months turnaround time um, before getting to a full differential diagnosis. Um, it is somewhat subjective as, as we discussed, right? Like, like it's all based on detector morphologic features and it requires the expertise of a pathologist in order to render that diagnosis. Um, I'm saying these these cons not to put pathology down. I think this is a, an amazing discipline that that really has such an important role in the patient journey. Um, but all these limitations really, in my opinion, pose the opportunity for for industry, for startups, for new technologies to provide better um, better care in the future. Probably the largest disruption in the pathology world has been the advent of digital pathology. 
Um, so the, the idea is that instead of using a light microscope and the human eye to, to look at the, the tissue morphology, one can now scan these digital slides and preview the images digitally. Um, from a technological perspective, that may seem sort of somewhat simple, right? One simply takes a photo of a slide, but the technical details are obviously um, very, very, very grand. If we compare the latest and greatest iPhone, um, like iPhone 13 Pro or Max, uh, it has like a resolution of 48 megapixel. If you compare that to the resolution that's achieved with a whole slide imager, it's about a factor of 500 smaller. Um, like these whole slide images achieve typically 16 gigapixels uh, scans of, of, um, of pathology slides. Um, this is achieved by taking pictures and then raster scanning essentially over the slide. Um, that also causes um, downstream consequences for, for archiving this data. Um, lots of odd opportunities there for, for companies that are innovating in that space. And then providing digital high-speed viewing systems, um, ideally through browsers, right, to review these images very quickly. Um, the most successful companies in that space are Philips, um, that really spearheaded the, the effort, as well as Leica like Biosystems with the acquisition of Aperio, um, that were really amongst the first ones to create these whole slide images. Um, I have friends in sort of software startups or consumer startups. And, and they look at this, it's like, well, isn't this really a, just a small change, right? We, we're not looking at this um, from a microscope, but we take a picture. Well, everything is digital now. Well, it turns out for, for pathologists, this was a, a major change. Um, the reason really is because digital path, uh, because primary diagnosis is just so important for the patient journey and it's therefore not taken lightly. So the most pathologists I've met um, really take pride in providing the most accurate diagnosis. diagnosis. So any technology that, that changes that and could possibly challenge um, the, the ability um, to provide diagnosis accurately has to be looked at with a lot of scrutiny. Um, that is certainly the, the position that the FDA took as well. Um, approval of these whole slide imagers took like probably on the order of 10 years. Um, this first big study um, was, was led by Philips and I've a lot of respect for for being able to pull off this such a big study. It involved tissue from about two thousand cases that were reviewed by multiple pathologists. So in total, they compared sixteen thousand readings across organ types between manual interpretation as well as digital interpretation, um, and demonstrated ultimately that the diagnostic rate um, was not significantly worse for the digital, which which ultimately led to the approval or the clearance of of this technology. Looking at it from a market perspective, um, it's about a billion dollar industry to, to provide digital um, pathology solutions. Um, originally, it was primarily driven by biotech and academic research. Um, this was before the, the, the clearance and approval of these devices. Um, more and more now it's becoming that hospitals use the technology for primary diagnostic and that starts taking up obviously the larger market segment. So the market is growing um, at, at a decent rate. Um, where the primary source of re um, revenue is from, from the device sales, um, but there's also software and storage solutions that, that end up, end up contributing to that, that revenue. So looking at like how pathologists perceive digital pathology, um, I think the, the largest sort of advantages are seen as like an easy way to retrieve images from the patient from like previous visits, being able to compare them very quickly. They also repaired, um, report like improvements in, in turnaround time and an overall more pleasant experience for the, for the clinical sign off. However, if one looks at the question sort of further below, there still is a lot of hesitancy of relying solely on digital pathology for, for primary diagnosis. I think in part that is a, a generational thing where it will just go away over time, but it also may highlight that maybe there wasn't even that big of a need in, in the first place for, for reviewing images digitally instead of looking at them traditionally with a microscope. I think the, the event that has mostly changed this um, has actually been the COVID pandemic. It, it Kind of, uh, it lined up in time with the approval and really forced a lot of pathologists to now review these images remotely. So digital review became, became key and is now integral part of, of many practices. The aspect that 
probably is most exciting about digital pathology and will be the, the biggest driver for, for its adoptions is that digitization enables computational pathology. So it's not only possible to look at images, but provide quantitative endpoints or quantitative scores um, for the images displayed. Um, the, the first original innovation in that field actually came out of the IHC staining world, where companies like Ventana, that was later bought by Roche, enabled these first automated platforms that identified positive and negative cells um, based, based on, on, on their features and was able to report a, a ratio in this case, right? Like a, a positive to negative, what like a positive nuclear ratio, essentially, as quantitative markers for, for, for this specific stain. Um, originally, all this tech, this was, was based on traditional, I would call it like 90s <laughs> technology, where one simply used like blob detectors to, to identify cells sort them by size and shape, color, and, and be able to like start quantifying images in, in this way. The major transformation happened with the advent of artificial intelligence. And I guess in this case, I call it like a gold rush of AI and pathology. I think there's sort of a gold rush in AI in, in, in many fields, um, but it is um, very naturally applied to pathology, right? Because these, these AI models tend to be very good at identifying images, quantifying large amount of data and, I, and extracting features. Um, so there's been a couple of very successful companies um, like, like Page AI, Path AI, Oprosha, and, and many more um, that, that have made major contributions to, to that field. Um, so before going into how this really be, is applied, I want to take a quick background on, on what AI really is in this context. And um, many of my computer science friends tend to get offended by it being called AI. Um, they say AIs are for pitch decks and machine learning is for engineering talk. Um, I think the best um, description really is deep learning. Um, and we will explain why, why that is. And the, the typical toolkit for, for deep learning are these convolutional neural networks. Um, the way to think about them, they're essentially feature extractors that are stacked on top of each other. So if one goes at low levels in a network, um, one ends up looking at, at, at lines and, and, and round shapes. Convoluting those further, it, it ends up becoming actual features like noses and eyes. And then at the very high levels of abstraction, one ends up actually having these maps that correspond to actual phases. The convolutional nature of, of, of these, these algorithms is that you can think of these filters as sliding windows applied across the image. So the question is not where are those features present, but are those features present? Um, really the, the architecture design got bigger and bigger and bigger through the advent of like a lot more and more computation. And that allowed these like feature extractors essentially to, to become more and more effective. Um, most of the companies actually use the same underlying technology that's very well known architectures. And what makes companies succeed or has made companies succeed is access to proprietary data sets that, that are large enough to like successfully train um, pathology models um, for, for AI models for pathology. They have, um, so, so there's typically two tasks available. Um, one would be a classification task where one inputs an image and then outputs a label so in the simplest case, one could ask this question, is this um, is image of cancer? Yes or no. Um, one could even ask sort of higher dimensional question, what is the type? Like what is the specific um, differential diagnosis? So in that case, the output would be like of dimension, a larger dimension, right? And really un unlimited. Um, that's a classification task. Um, the other type of tasks handled by AI are segmentation tasks, where instead of outputting a label, one actually outputs the contours of certain features. Um, this can be very helpful in, in pathology for, for cell detectors or, or, or feature detectors in a way that it allows highlighting where those are present in the image. In some cases, that can even be combined into sort of a classification task stacked on top of a segmentation task. There's been some innovation on the actual computer science side. Um, that is largely driven by the fact that 
these whole slide images are so much bigger than traditional images. And from a computational perspective, it's actually not possible to fit a whole whole slide image into the memory of, of a GPU. Um, so the typical approach has been to chop up the histology image into patches. These are these red squares here, and then perform the classification on a per patch level. Um, one of the major innovations was to essentially train a second layer of, of um, network that is able to assign attention to these various patches, where basically it says these are the few patches that actually most contribute to this diagnosis. So this combination of, of classification and, and attention then ultimately allows to, to generate a diagnosis for the whole slide um, using artificial intelligence all the way. That concept is, is, is known as multiple instance learning and was um, used in many of the successful AI products. So now looking at how is AI um, applied back to pathology, um, the only so far approved AI algorithm for pathology use um, is the one um, by, by Page AI, um, and it targets a specific application in prostate. Um, and the way the product works is that, that the image is first displayed for the pathologist for review, and then an AI layer is turned on to essentially display a crosshair and tell the pathologist, look here. And this is a very simple product, very naturally coupled right, to this attention layer in, 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 in multiple instance learning. Um, and the, the major question by the FDA was like, well, how effective is it, right? So um, Page AI was the first company to, to get a clearance for an, a patho for an AI in pathology. Um, what, what they had to do is they had to demonstrate an improvement in accuracy um, using the AI compared to not using the AI. Um, they did a study in, with 16 pathologists, so again, in about like 400 samples. Um, so again, a fairly large study that, that was demanded um, to, to demonstrate effectiveness here. Um, what they're able to show is that their overall sensitivity improved by 5%, and by, while the, the specificity um, was unchanged. Um, they were able to see the biggest improvements in, in general pathologists, so not specialized using remote viewing technologies. And that, that has sort of a little bit the flavor of the pandemic written over it, that that was such an important um, milestone in, 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 that, in that way. Commercially, I think the, the, judge, the jury is still out there how successful these products will be in the market, but it's, it's really exciting to see that the companies are getting first clearances and these, these products end up in, in routine clinical practice. Switching gears a little bit, um, most of the time we spend now on histopathology or cytopathology, right, which is the visual analysis of, of these slides. Um, this is not all that pathologists do. Um, there's also this big branch of clinical pathology, right, that's sort of more la laboratory driven. And in that world, um, sequencing and next generation sequencing um, really has been one of the, the major drivers of change. Um, what motivates this change is the, the general concept of, of precision medicine, right? Back in the, the 90s and beginnings of 2000s, there were chemotherapies um, available for cancer patients, but all the cancer patients were sort of basically seen as the same cohort. And it turns out that these uh, therapies were effective and safe in, in, in one subset, they were not effective, but still safe in another subset. They were effective, but had adverse effects in another, or they didn't work and cause side effects. The idea of precision medicine is that we, we have tools developed now that allow us to further pick those patient cohorts apart and assign them to the right treatment that is both effective and safe. Um, this is achieved through pathologists, through the addition of molecular markers um, to, to the um, diagnostic pathway. So if we look at the pipeline of, of, of novel um, therapies that, that hit the market, back in the, the 2000s, um, there were these platinum-based chemotherapies, right? Very broad acting um, um, drugs. Um, but in the, in the mid 2000s, one started seeing the first um, targeted therapies that, that were specific for certain biomarkers, right? So an EGFR is a typical mutation in, in lung cancer, ALK, um, you have BRAF, ROS1, um, and there are now more and more targeted therapies being developed that target a specific subgroup of 
adenocarcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas based on the molecular profile. Um, similarly, immunotherapies have been available since like 2015 that, um, that look at, at PDL1 expression, which is sort of a, a marker for immune activity in those cancer cells that can highly enhance um, the way the patients are, are being treated. So this puts a lot of pressure on the pathology departments to very quickly adopt these, these radical changes on how patients are being, um, being diagnosed. Um, this is a paper that came out last year and it, it sort of shows a sobering truth. I think what, what it demonstrated is that in, in the US about 90 approved targeted therapies for lung cancer and out of a thousand patients, only about 356 actually obtained that targeted therapy, um, which is really a shame given how, how well and effective the targeted therapies really are. Um, not spending too much time on this, but the, it's, a, it's a good read for, for the ones who are interested. It, it really analyzes practice gaps that, that result in, in this, um, this reduction of, 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 of matching patients to, to treatment. The way I look at all these practice gaps, right, these are opportunities for entrepreneurship, the opportunities for innovative products. So it's, it's very important to understand this. Ultimately, there's huge benefit for patients and a lot of commercial value along the way for, for solving these problems. Um, some have to do with just simple logistical aspects like referring a patient or then ultimately actually prescribing the targeted therapy, but a lot of also to do with like the way that biopsies are collected, um, the way that the biomarkers are then ordered for next generation sequencing, whether the doctors actually ended up having the time being able to wait for the sequencing call. So there's a lot of practical limitations that can be addressed with better technology along this, this pathway. Um, and I think this is sort of the, the conclusion of, of a lot of these technological advances that we are now seeing a, a merge, in, like a matching of coming out of histology, adding AI to more quantitative, like through quantitative pathology, um, enabled to be able to predict some of the molecular markers. So this was one of the, the first papers, but there's a lot of activity in that space now where AI systems can actually perform superhuman tasks in a way that they can review um, histology images um, and based on morphologic features, be able to predict um, the specific molecular markers. Um, it's superhuman in a way that like a pathologist could not perform this task, uh, but by being able to leverage um, these, these very deep neural networks, they, they can actually extract some of these features with extremely high um, accuracy. I think these were just first numbers and we'll get into um, systems that will achieve 95% accuracy levels. So switching gears a, a little bit, this was the general background of pathology and their trends. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about what we do at Invenue Imaging. Um, instead of focusing on differential diagnosis where there's been a lot of activities um, that we've, we've sort of covered in, in this basic review, we actually have focus on applications of, of pathology at the time of either biopsy or treatment, in this case, surgery. Um, where the major challenges there are is that one really wants to provide a, a fast but yet very accurate read um, um, based, on, based on histology images. So one of the application areas is, is biopsy adequacy, where the challenge is to determine whether the specimen is, is diagnostic or in surgical applications, pathologists typically support their, their colleagues in surgery um, in, the, in the case of, of uh, being able to identify tumor margins based on histologic information. Um, so this specific application for, for um, tissue adequacy, especially in lung cancers, can be a, a quite a big issue um, since traditionally um, lung cancer biopsies were performed um, under CT guidance, sort of penetrating the body from, from the outside, which ends up being a very invasive technique. Um, one of the, the greatest advances, advances in, in the bronchoscopy and interventional pulmonology field is the advent of robotic-assisted bronchoscopy, where the bronchoscopies can actually drive a steerable catheter far into the periphery of the lung and be able to perform biopsy in that in, in that regard. This is obviously a lot more less invasive than, than the um, 
because one doesn't actually injure the, the lung, which can cause to um, pneumothorax. Um, the major challenge is that a bronchoscopist sort of taking either using a needle or, or, or small forceps will extract a pretty bloody clot looking like piece of tissue. And the challenge is to determine whether that piece of tissue, when then sent to pathology, will ultimately um, result in the differential diagnosis. Um, there's a technique called ROSE or rapid onsite histology, where a cytologist actually comes to the operating room to perform a very quick analysis of the tissue morphology that is very effective, but ultimately not available at many of the centers that perform these procedures. Um, that approach also can't really predict um, whether a, di a biopsy is, is necessary diagnostic for molecular markers, um, since there's very specific requirements around the amount of cells that are required for a sequencing run. So, so there currently is no good way of predicting whether a, 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 a clotted sample like this will ultimately result in a positive molecular read. Um, with our technology, we, we, the, the imaging system called this the NIO, or NEO imaging system, and it's based on a technology called stimulated Raman histology, um, which was my, my PhD work in the lab of Sunny Shi at Harvard. Um, I can dive into this and happy to spend a lot of technical discussions with you on, on how this really works. But the bottom line is that we use laser spectroscopy to be able to very quickly image in the operating room. So we, we use spectroscopy for each pixel of the image and then use a computer algorithm to assign a pseudo stain to the resulting image that now makes it gives it this like pink purple appearance of traditional histology. So the major advantage of the technology is that the sample prep is so trivial, right? We don't need the big lab that I showed you on the first slide, but instead we can load a small piece of tissue in, into the imaging system and all the imaging is performed automatically. Um, we have centers um, around the world that, that actually use the technology and the nurses are very well suited to, to handle this tissue preparation. The, also advantage, the other advantage is that the imaging is non-destructive to the specimen because there's no dye staining or cutting performed on the specimen. And the same piece of tissue can then be retrieved and used for downstream analysis um, by either by pathology or, or for, for next generation sequencing. Um, so if you compare these, these, these workflows, right, on the bottom is the NEO workflow where we create a squash preparation of, of, of the tissue specimen. We stick it in the imager and the images pop up on the screen. Um, compared to the, the traditional way used um, that, that uses um, frozen section histology that required transporting the sample to a lab, freezing it, cutting it with the cryostat, and then mounting on a slide for staining, um, it, 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 it's just a labor intensive process where the sample changes hands many times. So, so typically that takes on the order of 15 to 40 minutes, um, which is obviously extremely fast from a pathology perspective and, and really requires immense logistical operational excellence to, to pull off quickly. But from a surgeon's perspective is a very long time if a surgical decision is based on, on the histology information. This shows a quick video of the NEO. Um, it shows Dr. Oringer. He's our co-founder, a neurosurgeon. Um, he just took a biopsy from, from one of his patients. So we see it. It's roughly the size of a grain of rice. Um, it's loaded into the NEO slide to provide a squash preparation and simply insert it into the imaging system. Images start popping up immediately, and it takes about two to three minutes to complete a scan of a, of a, a small tissue specimen. Those images can be like reviewed directly by the operating team, or they can be shared digitally through existing IT infrastructure. We have the partnership with Ambra Health in this case that then allows sharing images really around the world. So you can have an OR um, in New York um, that 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 is reviewed based on pathologist who is located in Los Angeles. Um, so this this whole digital nature now allows connecting um, operating rooms with the pathology expertise. Um, we've um, originally launched this product in neurosurgery. Um, we've imaged about 2,000 cases in, in neurosurgery across our various centers. But we've also worked very actively with those existing sites to broaden applications to, to other use cases. We've imaged specimens from the lung, from the prostate, head and neck tumors, um, kidney tumors in the renal system, breast cancer, as well as pancreatic cancers. And the bottom line is that the 
the imaging modality is actually very general um, across these tissue types. Um, as long as the, the biopsy is, is small, typically our um, preferred size is a, is a grain of rice and is somewhat squishable um, to like allow for the squash preparation. So there are certainly applications like bone cancer, right, that could not be addressed. But if the sample fits in the slide, um, the imaging typically is quite successful. Um, if we compare that to other technologies on the market, what we really pride ourselves for is, is image quality. Um, in all our design decisions for designing the system, we, we focused on image quality first. Um, we, we believe that being able to see the details and subcellular details is really critical for the pathology team to make good decisions. It's also important for AI systems, right? Because if, if the features aren't present in the image because it's not a high quality image, um, the AI will not be able to detect them either. Um, overall, we have about um, 13 systems in the field now, um, many happy customers and, and over like 3000 cases imaged so far. What we're now starting to do for the last couple of years is that we we added this AI layer um, that's so successful for, for differential diagnosis, right, in, in, in the general pathology setting, also to our imaging modality. And the, the idea is that by, by having the AI make simple decisions, like right, presence of cancer or non-cancer, we can provide an instant feedback to the surgical team. Um, the goal is not to necessarily provide a differential diagnosis like pathology would, but provide actionable information to, to the surgeons. Um, we have a series of publications um, that we can dive into more detail as well. Um, we actually first started with an application in, in neurosurgery where we tried to predict the full differential diagnosis. Um, so these are the 13 most common diagnostic classes in, in brain tumors. Um, we trained a neural network um, based on, on these labels from the patient record. And we're able to show that the resulting AI was actually non-inferior to the performance of a pathologist um, using traditional H&E-based methods. Um, this was a study at three centers across the U.S. Um, with an enrollment of like about 280 patients. Um, the continued in in innovation um, along those lines now has left, left, left us to a, a new paper that will come out later this year where we are able to go from just morphology-based diagnosis all the way to a... Um, molecular-based diagnosis. And this is really important since in, in, in brain tumors, there's been a big shift by the WHO in a way that um, the classification of, of glial tumors is no longer based on morphologic features, but is now defined primarily by the mutation status of the IDH mutation, ATRX mutation, and the 1P. Uh, 19q codeletion um, that distinguishes between the oligodendroglioma, astrocytomas, and glioblastoma. Um, this classification has major implications for how well patients will do, and therefore impacts how aggressive surgeons can be during do, or, or need to be um, during the surgery. However, um, at the current state, there's no good ways of obtaining this molecular status at the time of surgery. Um, since sequencing technologies take take hours and typically two weeks. So, so those are a really exciting application of, of pairing the NEO um, that allows instant imaging with an AI that can perform the superhuman task of, of predicting, um, predicting molecular status based on morphology. And based on a, a data set um, of about like 600 patients um, for which we had the molecular information, we were able to train an AI that was extremely accurate. So if we look at matrices like accuracy or area under the curve, um, we are in, in the 0.95 regime um, for these three mutations. And we're able to show that this is indeed non-inferior to IDH staining. So quite quite exciting um, pathway of, of bringing molecular diagnosis now to the operating suite and really extending this, this idea of precision medicine, not only to post-operative treatments, but also to the surgical realm. Um, we've recently announced a partnership with the Johnson Johnson Lung Cancer Initiative, um, where we'll run a, a big study like uh, involving about 900 patients um, to translate this technology from brain cancer also into lung cancer. Uh, we've already talked about sort of challenges um, in, in the um, 
at the diagnostic stage of identifying um, diagnostic tumors, but bringing diagnosis into the operating room has further applications where it could enable um, procedures of, of localized ablations, um, where we're through the same robotic bronchoscope and can now ablate the tumor. But one would not want to do that unless one can identify that, that there's truly cancer present in that lesion. Um, similarly, this concept of injecting um, chemotherapies and targeted agents um, locally into the lesion for which accurate diagnosis is obviously a paradigm. So with that, uh, I want to yeah, wrap up this, this um, presentation. Um, I think it's an extremely exciting time to be innovating in, in pathology. Um, the combination of, of both artificial intelligence and sort of precision medicine has created new, new challenges. Um, I always get asked, um, are you trying to replace a pathologist um, with, with AI? I think that is completely the wrong question. I think the, the best answer I've heard to this question is this idea of saying, it's not that a pathologist will be replaced by AI, but a pathologist that doesn't use AI will be replaced by a uh, like uh, will be replaced by a pathologist that uses AI, and I think that is a, a great vision, right? In, in a way that technologies should always enhance what 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 doctors do um, to ultimately provide the best outcome for the patients. Um, with that, uh, thank you. Um, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat that we can start reading and going through, and I, I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, um, Grace, for the for the wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, we do have a couple of questions in this in the chat. The first one is actually uh, from China is asking, um, um, did you guys try to use the Rayman uh, imaging for the pathology? Um, did you try to make the comparison with the traditional ones? Um, or what would be the um, result? Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I did skip over this this question um, for for the sake of time. So, um, as we sort of rolled out the technique, we didn't jump straight into artificial intelligence. Um, we we did indeed do a, a, a blind read study where we where we used um, a, a, a pathologist essentially reviewed the the neo images or the SRH images, and then after a washout period, also reviewed the matching frozen section images. And in in a couple of studies, actually reproduced at, at different centers, at both Michigan, Miami, and then also in in Freiburg in Germany. Um, all these studies basically demonstrated the the non inferiority of the technique over traditional methods. AI is really just an extension on top of that, and sort of highlights the fact that. Um, Obviously, the diagnostic features are there for the AI to be able to identify them. Yeah, um, thanks. Another question is about um, for the, I think it's asking for the endpoint for AI to do the analysis for the pathology. So right now, is morphology is only readout for AI mainly? Is there any other readout for uh, the person? Yeah, so so in, in terms of approved clinical products, right, the, the only approved um, clinical product is, is, is page prostate um, currently. I'm sure there's, there's a lot of products in, in the works and there's certainly more, more products in, approved in, in Europe as well. And I'm sure China as well. Um, in page prostate, um, what they did, they didn't even provide a classification. It was really positioned as a product that serves as an aid to a pathologist. So, um, the, the AI didn't provide the output. It just told the pathologist, look here. And by having that guidance, they were able to demonstrate that, that overall the accuracy of the, the call was improved. Um, some of the European products um, end up being, being more quantitative. There are some products for actually predicting molecular markers. Um, um, they all each have their, their different endpoints, right? And will all require their, their rigorous clinical study to in order to become mainstream. Um, in, in in pathology routine practice. Yep. Thanks. Any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand or um, ask uh, through the chat box. Any way is fine. If you're too shy, you can send the message to me. If the question is too difficult or improper question. <laughs> Personal question. Yeah, I got a question. Um, 
got a question that's asking for um, different combination of technology. Because for um, diagnostic, there are a lot of different technologies with the DNA implication in microarray uh, genotyping mass spec. So is there any way we can combine uh, every um, technology with um, microscopy as a uh, combination for the pathology? Thanks. Yeah, I, I, and I think that is sort of really kind of the, the general trend where probably pathology already is, but it's certainly heading that, that pathologists may move away from being purely like interpreting images, right? But they become sort of these um, aggregators of multiple streams of information. And even today, right? If one, one looks at a primary diagnosis of a difficult case, I, I spoke with a pathologist yesterday, right? And he says, well, like I need to get off the phone because I have this two hour case that I still sign off, right? So, so pathology really even today isn't a discipline where one looks at one tissue slide and um, creates a diagnosis. Looking at one slide may cause you to like order additional tests, right? Like those turn like maybe IHC stains, they may be sequencing stains and being able to, to then bring together all this information and really solve this puzzle of the primary diagnosis is, is ultimately really the job of, of the pathologist. So bringing technologies together is, is, is important. I think there's room for a lot of innovation in that um, phase in that that space as well, right? Being able to aggregate that information in a, in, a, in a in a simple way, maybe having AI sort of recommend certain stains, for example. So I think bringing or like or molecular tests, right? So so bringing information together to solve the puzzle is really the yeah the the major challenge, I think. Yep. Um, next question is asking for the data privacy, security, and accuracy. So how do you make sure the, um, the data is secure enough for a uh, patient um, and for, um, uh, for the, uh, on the privacy purposes? Yeah, no, data, data privacy is a, is, a, is a huge issue that that's, has to be taken extremely seriously. Um, in the US, there's an act that's called the HIPAA Act that, that really in, in, in the law sort of ensures that, that all images that include patient identifying information have been treated with extremely high scrutiny. Um, so it is still the case that most hospitals today in the US at least host all their medical data on the premise. So cloud-based solutions because of the, the, the data privacy um, have not gotten as much adoption as one would think. So, so I, I would imagine, like I, I, I'm fairly certain that most of the data today is still hosted on-premise. Um, there are companies like Amber Health that, that we are particularly partnering with that have created a fully HIPAA safe or HIPAA compliant online cloud-based platform. Um, they, they're doing quite well, I think, in terms of sort of being able to like share images quickly now. And I do think as, as sort of everything moves more and more digital, um, that will be the, the way of the future, but certainly, yeah, data privacy is a, is a big issue. Yeah, so um, a question from, from myself. So um, we know actually there are a lot of different ways for um, for the diagnostics and also for digital uh, pathology, but a lot of times the data from different hospitals, from different labs, institute. It's kind of like different, right? Like in terms of the resolution, storage, the analysis tools are crossing different groups. But how we can standardize every different um, like imaging or some other input of the data into one platform um, to have the unified uh, standardized in, uh, analysis across different platforms? Yeah, I think that's a, an excellent question. And uh, I think in this product development of, of Page Prostate, they had um, I forget the exact number, but hundreds of centers contribute data to, to their, their learning algorithms. Yeah. Um, this is a partic spe specific problem in, in pathology, right? Where like the, the staining protocols, the cutting protocols may vary largely between different hospitals, right? Some, some pathologists like some with thinner sections, some like thicker sections, some like dark stains, some like light stains, right? So yeah. all these centers have a very different, uh, protocols, um, the digitization method is also important. And if one actually reads sort of the indications for, for use for the, the page prostate, it is actually tightly coupled to the Philips whole slide imager. So this, this AI it, in its current regulatory state, to my knowledge, 
um, can only basically support the, the the one the one type of hardware as its input. Um, there are very interesting um, applications, and I, I I follow a couple of people on LinkedIn that, that post quite a bit about this, fusing sort of this concept of of domain adaptation, where one essentially uses a neural network as the input to the classifying network that transfers images from one domain to another domain. So one can basically train this like general AI that essentially generates histologic images based off the input images that are now designed to be um, very, very robust. So one can actually use AI to kind of create some level of standardization. I think that that approach will hold a lot of promise. Um, from our perspective, but in many, I think we look at this as one of our opportunities since we are label free, we're sectioning free. So like there's no manual input really required to the, the image generation. So we believe that our input data set is extremely robust and very reproducible, um, which ultimately is what we believe enables these high, high levels of accuracy for molecular prediction. Um, that we saw in this most recent work. Um, it is exciting because like this is done with like three institution, um, two of which were based in Europe. And we were looking at data that was trained based on, on University of Michigan on a single site. So even in a relatively small training set, we saw generalizability of the technique from, from one to the other. Um, obviously, I think modalities need to come together, right? And and I, like, I think being in never uh, operating in a, in a silo is never a good idea. So I think you, yeah, you raise a good, good point. And I think AI tools will ultimately solve that issue. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the, 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 the trend is going to AI eventually, the, especially the morphology based uh, observation. Actually, one question uh, from uh, Sina is also asking for the morphology. So um, um, it's asking like, are there any new uh, morphology features that is identified by um, the company um, that it was not identified before. So um, if, if yes, can we use that as newly distinguished uh, feature to, to train like the, the, for the future use of for the uh, pathology? Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting question, right? So, so this, this AI that I'm kind of familiar with in this particular case, right, that can predict these, these various molecular markers does so extremely well what is always a challenge with AI is that one has to almost look at it as a black box, right? One trains this network, it forms these connections, but one doesn't fully understand um, what the actual features are that are used to create this diagnosis. So, so there's an interesting sort of academic or research question, right? Can one extract sort of the most prominent features back out of a network in order to possibly inform what, what humans should be looking for? Um, so I think it's it's an interesting area for for active research to 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 look at this. Um, I'm not aware of a case where sort of a pathologist would now incorporate AI features, um, but that would be certainly very cool to see. Yeah. Uh, due to the time, um, let's ask for the last question. Actually, on my list, there are still a couple of questions, but I'll probably just um, ask for the last question. Um, so the question is asking for um, like the AI, um, because right now it's AI driven uh, mostly uh, on these directions. Is there any uh, ways that AI cannot replace um, compare with the human, uh, human, human being, like the judgment or um, um, assessment? Yeah, no, I, th I, I think absolutely, right? I think AI is used in a silo can be can be very dangerous, right? And and really, most AIs are 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 very limited to very specific questions, right? So if you look at the page AI approval, it, it focuses on 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 prostate cancer. Um, that AI applied to another cancer would would give completely um, wrong results. Um, AIs also typically can have challenges with sort of unexpected fringe cases, right? Where 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 certain features are just so obvious to a pathologist, but if they weren't represented in the original training set, um, they 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 may not be transferred to to the network, right? So, I think AIs are like first of all very specific. They should always be used together with all the other information that that are available, and um, also have to be used 
very well in within the uh, the boundaries for which would they have been intended to be used in. Um, that's why I believe sort of with, with this last sort of statement, um, I don't think that AIs will replace the, the, the pathologist, right? Like humans will have a great capability in, in terms of being able to aggregate all this information and, and, and applying sort of the human ingenuity to it. Um, but adding the quantitative tools will enhance the humans, right? To the pathologist to, um, to make more accurate diagnosis. And I think that's really kind of, I think how the technology, we, sh we, we should develop AIs with that in mind and never sort of have a goal of, replacing a human right yep okay so due to the time if you have more questions feel free to email us or using the chat box so we will probably um connect you guys if you have more questions i mean thanks chris for the wonderful talk we certainly learned a lot today uh thanks for your time the the, the purpose of the training series is actually for investors scientists and young entrepreneur with or without um the background uh, related to have a better understanding for the pathology. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you are interested in, um, uh, in venue, um, please stay connected. Yeah, I think the the, the, the email address is on the screen. Um, and there will be more events from QBay later. So we'll have our, our um, global pitch day on March 26th in um, San Jose. It's going to be an in-person event. Welcome to participate in our future event as well online or on sites our um contact as i think is in the chat box right now um um yeah thanks everyone thanks chris um have a good night and uh see you next time yeah thank you everyone